You're listening to the Michael Harding podcast. It's a cold winter's day on the 9th and 10th of March. And I have the stove on. You might hear it crackling. And I have my clock. If you hear a little tingling every so often, that's the clock. And there's been a lot of conversations recently about the lockdown and investigations coming up about everything that was done right and wrong. And I thought I would continue this week reading a little bit from the book, What is Beautiful in the Sky? It's a book I wrote during the lockdown, and I'll read from it now. The lockdown arrived in Ireland at the end of March, but I knew it was coming. I was alert to its imminent arrival for four weeks. Even when RTE asked me to travel for a radio interview in Dublin with Brendan O'Connor in late March, I said, no, I'm not moving. I told this to the researcher. She was a bit surprised. They had other guests travelling into the studio that morning. Well, says I, they won't be coming into the studio this time next week. And I was right. I had left Dublin on the 6th of March after attending an event in City Hall the previous night to celebrate the work of the Samaritans in Ireland. It turned out to be the final time. Although it was a week later, on the 12th of March, that I realised clearly what was coming and began to shutter myself away for hours each day in my study alone in the self-imposed isolation of that room. And when the lockdown officially arrived, I was well settled in the hills above Loch Allen with my beloved. In the course of the following three months, all that we were was taken away. As a nation, we became passive robots overnight, and in particular the elderly cocooners, a word that lives phonetically between buffoon and baboon. People were masked and isolated in the shopping malls and garden centres, the supermarkets and the pharmacies, at a two-metre distance, even from loved ones when they fell ill. Some waved through glass windows at their relatives, even as they were dying. Some waved from car parks and waiting rooms and smoking areas through screens on their iPads to bid farewell. Today, the 7th of June, I am finalising the manuscript I have written in that confinement. I worked every day in my studio at the back of the house and walked in the garden for exercise day and night for 12 weeks. The garden is really a wilderness and comprises just under an acre of woodland, beside which is a small house, an artist's workshop and my own shed or studio. To the south is the woodland of between 70 and 100 young trees, holly, chestnut, Spanish chestnut, birch, gelder rose, beech, willow, Norwegian maple, oak, Canadian maple, and Chilean beech. There's a carpet of bluebell, garlic, and other wild flowers. The foxgloves grow in the shade, and have not yet reached their full height, nor have they yet come into bloom. That will happen in July. To the north is the house, where the beloved still sleeps, as I slip out the patio door and venture into the woodland. I walk through this grove of beech and birch and emerge to the east, looking further east, across the full length of Loch Allen and at Schlieveneren on the far shore. At the perimeter is a wire fence with cement posts protecting us from a cliff, a sixty-foot drop lined with gorse, where I walk until I come to my studio in the northeast of the territory, 
a standalone building 25 feet by 25 feet, with one patio door on the eastern side, offering me another view of the lake. There are two windows in the apex roof, and a medium-sized window looking south to the woodland. I slide the door of my studio open and go inside. It has been a long journey since January. I was in Warsaw, and there was news of a virus in Wuhan, and it had not occurred to me what might be ahead. We were looking at a house for sale in Donegal, and dreaming of being there by the 1st of May. I imagined a perfect sunny day, opening the door to begin a new life by the sea. But when the 1st of May came along, we were still in Leitrim, locked down, and the world had changed. <coughs> o oh Mary, we crown thee with blossoms today, as the children used to sing, but they didn't sing it in 2020. We were taken away from a universe that was revolving around us, as if just for us, and we found ourselves back in a contingent, strange and dangerous place, where we needed each other because we were vulnerable, and where it was us that spun around some centre in the cosmos that we didn't quite comprehend. The apex roof inside my studio creates a triangle with three pine cross beams to buttress the walls, and the space has a feeling of height more akin to a small church than to a workroom. Here began my complete silence. I have two desks, a Georgian bureau from the late 18th century and a partner's desk from the late 19th century, the work of the famous Maple Company of London, Paris and Buenos Aires. I bought these precious antiques from a dealer in Donegal. They are both aligned beneath the soft south-facing window and establish for me the very crucible of my work, as an altar might be the highest energy point of a well-built church. The big partner's desk is the place where I sit every day to write my stories, because I take my craft seriously, and, of course, I mean what I say in all my stories. But the real magic... And there's the bell. <laughs> but the real magic of stories is that they don't contain the truth. They point to the truth. They are not the moon. They are the old person's finger in the boat, standing up in the night and pointing to what is beautiful in the sky. And the young man or woman follows the finger and sees the moon, and their heart opens to the moment. That's what stories do, or at least that's what they did in the long ago time when people believed in stories. Not in the truth of them, but in the telling of them, the saying of them, and the heart opening as it does in the listening. And here now I sit again at my desk for one more day to read over this, to, to, to correct a few spellings, integrate a few loose paragraphs, question some of the details, alter an occasional sentence, and most importantly, to write an ending. It's always a moment of achievement for an author to view the final draft one last time before another story is born. I suppose if I never wrote another word, the person I would really miss writing about would be the general. It was a long time ago that I first drowned the shamrock with him in a Mullingar hotel in 2006 after I first arrived in Westmead. It had been a time of great expectations. I was newly arrived in Mullingar and had begun writing a column in the Irish Times about ordinary life in the town. I felt I might be on the verge of great achievements 
I mentioned to the general that I even intended climbing the reek that year. Be careful about that, he said. I said, I shall wear climbing boots so I don't sprain an ankle. He said, it's not the ankles you need to worry about, it's the wind. I said, you can't avoid wind if you're on a mountain. He said, you're not getting my point. Mountain climbing is a useless and unnecessary exercise, and excessive exercise is widely recognized as a cause of flatulence. He should know he breaks wind like an officer's horse, and usually excuses it by saying, I'm becoming more like Dr. Swift by the day. As if his wind was as bracing a comment on modern society as one of Jonathan Swift's pamphlets might have been about the world he lived in. When a man exercises, he shakes up the innards, and the intestines are left like a leaking balloon, so beware of the mountain. We were sitting in the foyer. Green shamrocks had been painted on the windows. The receptionist wore a leprechaun hat, and the foyer was full of children in green uniforms. The general finished his sixth pint of Guinness and belched pleasantly. And avoid cabbage, he declared, at all costs. Bacon and cabbage are consumed by the Irish in unnatural quantities, but people don't realize that cabbage can do to the stomach what a lighted match does to a tank of petrol. I used to feed it to the horses years ago when I lived in Hampshire, the night before a hunt to make them jump higher. You may be correct about the cabbage, I conceded, but nobody could accept that climbing a mountain is a cause of flatulence. My good man, he said, when I was meditating in India, I always did yoga exercises before sitting. Then, when I began the meditation, I often experienced methane bursting from various orifices. My guru explained that this initial period of the meditation session is known as the settling of the winds. But I was only doing yoga. Consider what you would be like after climbing the reek. The general's massive eyebrows lifted, and he stared at me with great intensity. Then, looking towards the bar, he bellowed, Bartender, two more pints of your finest stout, please. There was a tall woman sitting on a nearby sofa, wrapped in a fur coat and sipping from a long glass of something green through a straw. She was listening to the general with great attention. Those hippie families in the West, the general said, give their children nothing but lentils, and when the poor creatures go to school, everybody laughs at them. The woman on the sofa rose. Clearly she had heard enough. She approached us, and I dreaded what she might say. I kept chickens, the general continued. When I lived in Kilkenny, I would cook one occasionally in a pot and make a hot curry, and by jingo, if there was curry left over, I fed it back to the other ones in the yard, and they lapped it up. I said, that's disgusting. Ah, yes, he said but they laid wonderfully spicy eggs. Forgive me for interrupting, the lady said, her eyes on the general, but I believe we knew each other when you lived in Kilkenny. The general's face brightened. Delia, he exclaimed with great excitement, and he stood to embrace her. And just then, and without the slightest embarrassment, he broke enough wind to sail an armada. Oh, don't mind me, it's only the Guinness, he declared, as two more pints arrived on a tray with little shamrocks imprinted on their creamy heads. It was hardly six a.m. 
but my phone actually rang at this point in my re-reading of the script, and I smiled to see it was the general. When I answered, I heard him breathing with difficulty. For a moment I wondered had he caught the disease. You're up early, I said. Are you okay? Just tired, he said. That's all. I can't sleep. And I'm fucking fed up with this. We have to get out tomorrow. We must meet. What say you to a lunch in Mullingar? I smiled. We can't, I said. Tomorrow there are things opening, but not everywhere, and there is no travel allowed yet, outside your region. So no matter what opens tomorrow, you're still stuck in Mullingar, and I'm still stuck in Leitrim. Fuck that he whispered. Fuck that. I thought it was over tomorrow. After a few other pleasantries, he hung up, and the fire log burst into flame, and the four briquettes I mounted on top of it reddened at the stove. There's nothing I love more than going to my study very early in summer, when it's still chilly from the clear night, and lighting a token fire in the stove. It's a kind of ritual, like lighting candles before a service. On the eastern wall of the room is my father's bookcase, in which I house my icons. The Christ of Sinai icon, from Belarus. The Madonna of Kazan, from Warsaw. The Column Kill icon, also from Belarus. These are hand-painted works of art by masters of the craft. The shelves are also replete with other images and icons of lesser significance, as they are merely reproductions of originals. St. Zenia of Petersburg, Rubliev's Holy Trinity, Christ the Bridegroom, and a rare Russian icon of Sophia, the wisdom of God. And on my writing desk is a photograph of my wife. Sitting on top of the writing bureau is the woofer for my Samsung sound bar, and on top of that is a golden Buddha, which I brought home from a Tibetan monastery near Mongod in India. Above that hangs a painting of the Buddha Manjushri, and a photograph of the learned Tibetan Lama who lives in West Cavan, the Reverend Panchen Utrul Rinpoche. If I could add something Islamic that might allow me to open my heart in that direction, I would have it. But so far, I have not met the proper teacher to advise me, and for me, religious objects are useful tools rather than ornaments. No doubt someone might enter the room and be horrified by such an opulence of religiosity and such an overdose of deities from diverse religious traditions all sitting down together in the one space. But on the other hand, you might come into my study and find none of these holy icons or objects on the wall at all, because very often I gather them reverently into boxes and hide them away in the press or mask the glass doors of my father's bookcase with blue silk curtains to shield the icons from the world. I do this when my faith has diminished, as it often does, and in complete devastation I just stare at the empty walls and view my faith with no more hope or optimism than a character in a play by Samuel Beckett. But when my hope and faith in metaphors returns, I take them out and scatter them once again like flowers in springtime on the walls and on the many shelves. They appear and disappear. And they appear and disappear as my faith ebbs and flows. And they reflect, I suppose, the nature of faith. It's not something that I can ever hold or make secure. It's not founded on any presumption about what is truth. 
but it comes and goes like the Atlantic tide on the long white beach at Carrick Finn in Donegal. It struck me as I reflected on the phone call that perhaps the general was close to giving up the ghost, and I felt that the abrasive comedy and scatological fire which fueled him in the past was gone. He had sounded utterly dejected on the phone. Another two months of this confinement would be unbearable for him. Perhaps I should phone him back, assure him that August will come, that they will find a vaccine, that we will get together again some day, and that if he could master Zoom and get his Wi-Fi sorted, then we might be able to have a laugh or indeed a drink some evening online, which I knew he was well capable of, without the staff in the nursing home knowing what he was doing. But that would not convince him. When despair takes root in an old man's heart, there is no rational remedy. Not even COVID-19 is as malignant as despair. And nothing is as susceptible to disease as an unloved heart. What the general urgently required was an embrace. From a grandchild or partner or just a decent friend. But he was bereft of them all and there was nothing I could do to soften that fact by any pep talk on the phone. He would see through it and be further wounded by my condescension. So I didn't phone him back. For the first few years in Mullingar, I felt displaced. In fact, the title of my column in the Irish Times was Displaced in Mullingar. And I was. After ten years in a remote corner of rural Ireland, I felt socially inadequate in Mullingar, in Westmead society where conversations invariably focused on equestrian matters, and I was always left with nothing to say. People got so involved with horses that in some houses close-circuit TV was installed so that guests could watch the newborn foals in the stables while eating their dinner. The foals in the stables lay down, or stood up, or ducked under their mother's bellies to get milk, and everyone watched the black and white screens with an intensity usually reserved for dramatic episodes of casualty. I remember one Sunday, sitting through a supper of lamb chops without uttering a word, I was worried that the other guests might think I was depressed, and so to demonstrate that I was capable of frivolous chatter, I mentioned that my cat had fleas. The host stared at me as if I had just said that Joe Dolan was Chinese. Well, I don't think she has them any more, I continued, digging myself deeper into the hole. Last Friday I was eaten alive with them in the bed, but I've had no bite since. I had an urge to scratch my beard, which I did without thinking. But as my fingers dug into the hairs beneath my chin, other guests glared at me in such horror that I feared they might ask me to leave. They didn't. But I left anyway, and went home to bed, and got bitten again. It was around that time that I first met the General. He stopped me in the Greville Arms one day as I was getting lunch. Are you the Irish Times man with the fleas? he asked. And then he laughed and explained how someone who was at the dinner party had told him the story. Back then he was always on the lake in May, and he'd phone me from his boat in the middle of Loch Ennell. My gilly is rowing as we speak, he declared. You ought to be here. I was silent. For goodness sake, don't make a martyr of yourself, 
he said. Is your prostate on the blink? I beg your pardon? The prostate, he repeated. Is it acting up? I said, my prostate is perfectly fine. Good, he bellowed. Delighted to hear it. A man over fifty should worry about nothing else in the world except his prostate. If that's ship-shape, then all the rest is roses. Five years later, my own prostate acted up so much that I passed a night in the bathroom screaming in pain before being rushed to Mullingar Hospital where they relieved me with such delicate surgery that I was singing the praises of the health service for years afterwards. But the general talked like that and there was nothing I enjoyed more than a morning stroll with him to walk aimlessly around the busy town of Mullingar as the sunlight fell down on the narrow streets and shafts of it slanted through the windows of the harbour place shopping centre and the grey-haired musician outside the door played a mellow tin whistle that threw a rich soundtrack over the accidental buzz of all that town life. The general strutted the streets like a loose bull, gawking at silver-lipped teenagers, the struggling mothers, the screaming buggy babies, the tall booted slavs, and the little pot-bellied men who walked small dogs along the canal. The general asserted that pot-bellied men so resemble monks carved on ancient monuments that one could not possibly resist the idea that such was the shape and size of the earliest inhabitants of this island. The fur bollog, he would proclaim, the belly men. Some mornings the general and I took coffee and café le monde, or at lunchtime we might eat a bowl of Mama Lingi's pasta on the corner of Grove Street and Blackhall Court. One day I asserted that Lingy's little parlour was almost as good as the wonderful Roma Café on Bridge Street in Cavan. I've never been to Cavan, the general replied rather dismissively. Across the road, Wisteria, a shop of posh fashion accessories, had a big sale sign in the window, and a man was coming out of Stars and Bows, the hobby and craft shop with a model of the Titanic under his arm. And to our left we could hear the laughter of women from the open door of the hair salon reflections. We were eating slices of pizza on the street. This is delicious, I said. The general agreed. I have heard it said, he told me, that sometimes the hairdresser orders slices for her clients, if they're a bit low on sugar or unhappy with their husbands. Do you know, he added, that a good hairdresser is better than a psychotherapist, although at this stage they're probably twice the price. We were staring at the boarding across the street. I wondered what was behind it. He told me, that that was where the archaeologists found the skeletons of 12th century monks a few years earlier. There was a lot of pride in Mullingar when they found those monks, he said. They had shells around their necks that showed that they had done pilgrimages to Spain. Mullingar was always European, he added, wiping his lips. Then his eyes darkened. Banana boxes, he declared. I beg your pardon? Banana boxes, he repeated. That's how the holy monks left Mullingar, in banana boxes. After sleeping peacefully beneath the car park for eight hundred years, they were sent off to some storeroom in banana boxes. It was no way to treat holy men. He was becoming emotionally volatile, so I changed the subject. 
I think I might abandon my barber, I declared. Why so? Well, I said, for a start, I never get offered a slice of pizza when I'm depressed. And the last time I was there, he wanted to cut the hairs in my ears. Did you let him? Of course I let him. How could I stop him? The general was horrified. You have gone far beyond the help of a hairdresser, he said. You need a psychiatrist. And there are machines nowadays, he added, slightly embarrassed by the delicacy of the subject, for the ears. The relationship between me and the general was one of boy and man, me still a boy at fifty and him still a man at seventy, and I couldn't imagine him being happy for a single moment without an argument. But time passes, and in the turning of an eye, I was in my late sixties, and he was in his late eighties. The remembrance of him as an elderly but bullish mentor was no longer tenable. He was infirm, his eyes were weak, his hand shook, and now in the time of the virus, as he looked out the window, all his might and prowess were gone and he shrunk. I don't know how, so I couldn't dare to imagine what he was going through in his armchair with a Foxford rug around his knees during the lockdown. But as I remember him, he swaggered ahead of me on the street and was taller. Or when he was still driving, I recall sitting in the back seat of his car, clutching a briefcase on my way to Dublin. His niece was in the front seat. "'What's in the case?' his niece inquired. "'Nothing,' I admitted. "'I just carry it for comfort.' The Dundrum Town Centre shopping emporium was ideal for a day out with the General. It was big enough for both of us to lose each other, and thus... I wouldn't ever know what he was up to. I went up and down the sloping escalators all afternoon, imagining myself in Star Trek, and was only mildly disappointed that I didn't get chatting to someone, the way I usually do in Mullingar. But then I met Nancy, a white-haired old lady with sunken jaws and large spectacles, as small as a bird. She talked to everyone along the mall and in the clothes shops. She was staring at the top shelf in the dairy section of the supermarket when I almost bumped into her. I don't like the Tesco milk, she declared, as if she knew me. But I don't see any small cartons of Avonmore. Are they up there on that shelf? I reached up and took down a small carton of champion milk. Will that do? The bee's knees, she said. I met her again at the cold meat counter, where she was getting slices of Denny's ham, and at the shelves of bread, where she was looking for something high in fibre, and at the sweets, where she was trying to shovel jelly babies into a bag. At the checkout, I noticed little sashes of cat food in her basket. I said, my cat only eats fancy stuff that the pet shop sells. She sized me up. You're a very educated man, she declared. Why do you say that? Oh, I can tell from the briefcase, she said, laughing. And then she darted away down the mall like a little sparrow. Maybe I've always been attracted to old people's attention. Or maybe it's because I always knew that the older a person is, the more stories they have. Or maybe it's because I was always afraid of ageing and couldn't admit it to myself. Such was the authority of the general twenty years ago that he could tell me how to brush my teeth, and if I didn't do it as he urged, he would be offended. And when Osama bin Laden was shot by the Americans, it was the general who explained it all to me. Osama bin Laden was merely following a rule of thumb known to all terrorists that the best place to hide 
something is under the light. People might expect him to be in the dark caves of Afghanistan, but not in a big compound in a swanky suburb right beside a military base. Surely you remember that strategy from your own time along the border in Cavan. The IRA or any other terrorist group in familiar is familiar with the same tactic. Hide yourself under a lamp. Am I not correct? He eyed me sideways like a crocodile. How would you know anything about the IRA, I asked. I have my sources, he puffed in Northern Ireland. What does that mean, I wondered. Special branch, he whispered, with enormous reverence. In fact, the principle of hiding something in the most conspicuous place possible reminded me of a night long ago during the Troubles. It was a snowy winter, and I was drinking in a pub very late, while outside the hills were crawling with Gardi and various armies, protecting us from gunmen, who were always trying to move weapons across the border. When the last drinks had been served, the late drinkers moved to the kitchen, as was the custom, and soaked up the alcohol with bacon sandwiches and mugs of strong tea. Invariably the gossip was about cattle, sheep, and the guns out there in the dark. And then an innocent question provoked a story. Did anyone hear that the Free State Army lost a man last night? No, nobody had heard anything special, but everyone turned to the storyteller and waited. The man with the story was tall and had black oily hair and wore a coat. He had big black eyebrows and smoked sweet afton cigarettes. He drove a Ford Cortina and always carried bales of hay in the back seats for his cattle up the mountains. A man of many sheep, a dog always beneath his seat who could cross mountain ridges as lively as a buck goat. A man who knew more about the war outside the door than he was ever prepared to admit. Snow fell in the yard, and we munched thick sandwiches and supped on sweet tea. It was a new recruit that had been lost, a small spectacled man out on his first patrol. His company had been deployed in a windy ditch on the snowy mountain near where the Gardaí usually set their checkpoints. There being no traffic, the Gardaí and army drove on to where a lonely farmhouse was tucked into the elbow of the road. Dozens of cars were parked all around the farmhouse, which raised the sergeant's suspicions. So they stopped. The soldiers hopped into the ditch, in the blinding snow, and the sergeant went to the door of the house, half expecting to find a bomb factory inside. The door opened. Ah, sergeant! A black-robed widow declared, You're very welcome. The wake was in full swing, and the widow presumed the policeman too had come to sympathise. Ireland is a small place, and he was the local sergeant, and he could hardly confess that he was there to search for AK-47s. So he went in and took tea, and then a mouthful of whisky and agreed that the death was sudden and that at seventy-eight her husband was not an old man. Outside, the wind swept sleet across the mountain, flattening the rushes, and an hour passed before the sergeant emerged and hissed at his driver to get him home. "'Lord Jesus!' the widow exclaimed when she saw so many soldiers crawling out of ditches. "'It was very good of you all to come.' The soldiers boarded the jeeps and the convoy vanished into the swirling snow on its way back to base. Back in barracks, the commanding officer realised he was a man short, so the convoy retraced its tracks in the snow and found one soldier in the ditch, gone at the ready, still waiting for orders. 
He had poor eyesight and was completely deaf, and in the wind and snow he had neither heard nor seen his comrades leaving. The man had finished his story, and everyone agreed it was a blessing that the poor soldier had been found. They praised the sergeant for being so sensitive, and for paying his respects to the grieving widow. "'That widow was a fine lady,' someone muttered. "'Ah, she is,' another agreed. "'She comes from a great Republican family.' "'Oh, she does indeed,' a further voice affirmed. "'Wasn't her husband from across the border?' "'Oh, he was, surely,' the tall man said. Oh, "'Where did the bury him? "'Across the border,' the tall man said, smiling. "'There were checkpoints on both sides, "'but the hearse got through without any bother. I feel it's safe enough to tell stories like that now because time has passed. Many of the participants are dead and gone, and the politics has changed, and stories don't cost lives the way they once did. And I have thrived on gossip. I have made an art of rediscovering small stories, finding in the meaningless meanderings of strangers and other ordinary people a kind of heroic failure, or faith in what is impossible. And that is the end of my little reading from the book What is Beautiful in the Sky, which I read because I thought, well, it is just three years this week that the whole problem with COVID began. And here we are, and it's like, oh, there's so much to say about it, but that's as good as I can do for today, is to share that story with you. And thank you for being here.